Um, good afternoon. I hope everybody's been enjoying invigorating walks between the sessions. It's a good way to wake up and uh, uh, process some of the presentations you've just heard. It's been a rich day. Um, my name is Elisa Arend. I think we all may have met, or at least one way, <laughs> this morning. Um, I'm really honored to be uh, chairing this session, which is on feminist resistance, feminist resistance to fossil fuels. Um, we have a smaller panel than other sessions. We had a couple presentations. Uh, presenters have to drop out at the last minute, but we have a very novel um, methodology, which we'll be sharing in this session um, momentarily. Um, we have three presenters with us, uh, sorry, four presenters with us today. Um, the first one to speak will be Oscar Santiago Vargas Guevara um, from the Network of Community Initiatives, RICO. Um, his presentation, and he will also, Oscar will give us an introduction to the methodology I've described, a feminist methodology. So we'll be thinking through in the practice of um, feminist approaches. Um, secondly, we have Andrea Cardoso Diaz, who will, uh, is from the Universidad de Magdalena, um, who will present on ecofeminism, the route to fossil fuel resistance in Colombia. And third, we have Jenny Stevens from Northeastern University, who will speak about feminist anti-racist leadership for climate justice. Um, I will pass the microphone on to Oscar to present uh, the process will be that will be integrated into the presentations. And uh, fourthly, uh, Nemonte Nenkimu, who we heard from this morning, is also going to share some reflections with us um, following the other presentations. Thank you, Nemonte, with the support of Alex. <laughs> Thank you so much, Elisa. Uh, hello, everybody. Oscar Vargas, again, from the Community Initiatives Network uh, in Colombia, RICO. Uh, we will be talking today uh, about uh, three different approaches to feminist resistance to fossil fuels uh, in two cases in Latin America, one case uh, from the United States. Uh, and we thought, we, we figured that it would be a good opportunity to pay homage to the different methodologies that feminist movements across the world, and in our case in Latin America, have sprouted over the last decades and have created, contributed amazing insights into different ways of approaching uh, these different uh, problems. Specifically, we will be using the body territory mapping, a methodology that was created uh, in Ecuador and ha that has been in use uh, throughout Latin America for over for a bit less than two decades, and that has uh, given us new understandings of the relationship between uh, corporality as our own body and corporality in terms of the shared uh, environment, the shared territory uh, that we inhabit. Uh, you will be seeing uh, different approaches to this methodology throughout our three presentations, um, as well as in the inputs that we'll have uh, afterwards. And uh, during the discussion afterwards, we also invite you to, to bring these uh, reflections into uh, the forum. Uh, you'll be seeing it a bit closer as soon as we go. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, the idea is that to, to try to uh, locate the different impacts and the different resistances that emerge from uh, the body, specifically the body of women in uh, carbon and coal bearing regions and how that interplays with one another, that oppression and that resistance as felt through the body. Uh, all right, in terms of my presentation, I will be presenting the book Outlooks from Below for Just Energy Transitions, Gender, Territory, Sovereignty, which you will be able to see over there. You're more than welcome, as a matter of fact, actively encouraged to take these uh, copies of my hands, uh, they're free, uh, which is a book that we were able to do with a team of over 13 collaborators, uh, academicians like Andrea, myself and Felipe, who's currently not with us, um, community leaders in four communities uh, in Colombia, in particular in the Caribbean region and in the Boyacá department, which is in the Indian region of the country, uh, and other activists and ac academicians from Germany and uh, Colombia. A uh, quick disclaimer uh, about why is a white passing man talking about feminist resistance and the lived experience of, of women in this country. So I think it's very important to address it right away. It's not ideal. <laughs> let, let me like say that right out of, right out of the bat. Uh, an approach that we've had since the very beginning is to uh, 
at all, by all means prioritize that it is these women themselves in the territories that are sharing their experiences in their own terms and in their own voice. Uh, in this specific case, we decided that I will be the one showcasing uh, these experiences in terms of logistics, in terms of language, uh, in terms of also the very short uh, nature of these inputs and, and the more general uh, nature of them. Just, just to put it out there, it's less than ideal, we are fully aware, but hopefully this little uh, disclaimer helps explain, if not fully justify, that it is me uh, giving this presentation today. Uh, just a quick context. Uh, Colombia is one of the world's top producers of coal. We have two kinds, two main kinds of, of coal uh, extraction in Colombia. First of all, large-scale mining, which is mostly in the Cesar and La Guajira regions up in the uh, northern part of the country, and small-scale mining more in the Indian regions uh, of the country, so we like in the internal parts of the country. Large-scale mining is responsible, was responsible for 51 million tons in 2020. 92.5% uh, of which was destined uh, to be exported, specifically to Turkey, Chile, Brazil, and Israel as our, for, as our foremost uh, coal buyers, um, and until not, long, not so long ago, Germany as well. Whereas small-scale small -scale mining uh, is responsible for far less, 3.9 million tons in 2020, uh, and most of which was used for national consumption. That will be an important distinction when we uh, board the analysis that we make in different in different contexts. Of course, uh, as we uh, know in this in this context, uh, coal brings a lethal curse to the to the countries and to the territories uh, that it affects. It has environmental impacts from soil degradation, river deviation and contamination, air pollution, uh, deforestation, and so on. Impacts on health, uh, cardiovascular, neurological, and respiratory conditions, specifically for infants or children under five, year, five years of age. Issues of security, in the case of Colombia, funding of paramilitary groups uh, was encouraged through these um, big multinational companies. Social impacts, including the degradation of the social fabric and the cohesion uh, inside the local communities. Uh, Gender-based impacts, insofar as these mines also act as hubs for prostitution and a uh, sense of heightened uh, gender violence uh, and femicide. And as well as cultural impacts, um, which Monte actually addressed uh, earlier today, uh, insofar that these projects uproot entire communities and uh, yeah, encourage the loss of, of their own ways of life, leading to epistemicide or the killing of entire ways of knowing and understanding the world. Uh, and yet, it is local communities, as we, as we also heard previously, that have led a fierce resistance to coal uh, and fossil fuels, and women have been at the forefront of that struggle. In that context, uh, within the Community Initiatives Network, we started uh, uh, grappling out, coming up with partners such as the uh, University of Magdalena, the Technical University of Berlin, uh, the Friedrich Herbert Stiftung, as well as four communities uh, that are in coal-bearing regions in the country. Uh, two communities that are in the uppermost uh, part of the map in La Guajira, the communities of Manantial Grande and Provincial, uh, the Afro community of La Sierra, which is in the middle uh, circle in the map. Uh, all these three communities are affected by large-scale mining, and the peasant community of Mongi, which is in the lower part of the map, which is affected mostly by small-scale mining. So there are different impacts, different uh, conditions and dynamics. Um, but, uh, but yeah, but we still identified very, very uh, related uh, dynamics that we'll be able to see further along. Uh, the ambition of this research was thus to jointly develop inputs from women in these territories to think and plan truly just energetic transitions that can be translated into policy, community action, and social movement strategy. Those were our three uh, main uh, recipients, let's say, of, of the research, policy, communities, and social movements, but bringing the, the wisdom and the life experience of these contexts into the forum. Uh, thus, in dialogue through different workshops, different pedagogy and different pedagogies and different uh, yeah, dialogues, we came to three main axes uh, for the analysis, which is gender, understanding gender as this constructed uh, notion that is also uh, fluid and that comes with very specific uh, power dynamics between uh, that are exercised upon women and upon men that maybe do not ascribe to the traditional notions of masculinity. Territory understood as a 
wide array of meanings and belongings, not just the physical space, but also the cultural symbols and the, the ascriptions that we, that we place on them and how the territory also shapes us in return. And community sovereignty, understood as how communities in dif different places can exercise their autonomy and their sovereignty upon their own territory and upon their own inhabitants. And through that, we arrived at recommendations, as I said, for policy, communities, and social movement actions on three dimensions. Mining extract, the mining extractive transition, or the closing of mines and everything associated with it. Energy democratization, so ensuring that these communities and the population in general has an equitable access to energy. And broader just transitions, which include much larger, must, uh, much more encompassing transitions in terms of education, in terms of economy, uh, in terms in general of society, that can help uh, contribute to ensuring this, uh, this other transitions uh, can stay in time. Um, all right, uh, to start now with our methodology on the body territory mapping, uh, the idea is we will be uh, locating uh, through, through the different methodologies that we use with women, locating into the body of this uh, woman on the screen, uh, how they perceive the different impacts and the different resistance from, from within themselves, within their own bodies. And I'll give you a couple examples of how we integrated that into the analysis. This wasn't the only methodology we used, but it's already a pretty good example to see how uh, we were thinking when we approached this research. Uh, in the case of indigenous women in La Guajira, the northernmost part of the country, Perhaps the symbol, the, the, the place that was um, referred to the most was the, uter the uterus, which they related to the ter their entire territory as a whole. Insofar that earth, uh, in their language ma, is uh, the uterus that births all life. And open pit coal mines are open scars, open wounds within the territory, which is even a very visual uh, allegory and reality. Uh, and, that's, and that's how they perceive that impact also upon themselves in so far that uh, to most of the female leaders we, we interviewed and worked with, uh, perhaps the worst of the impacts are health conditions to their own children, specifically those below the age of five, representing a very heavy, harsh impact uh, on their lives, but which at the same time is what motivates it, most of them to become active in the struggle against coal. So it's important to see this interplay between Oppression, very real oppression, and action on behalf of these women and how these things uh, correlate. Departing from these uh, observations, uh, we arrived at uh, different uh, realizations. First of all, understanding that the impact of coal on the territory itself is incalculable in US dollars, for example. And we must acknowledge that these violations uh, are ex uh, were exercised upon the territory as a living be. Thus, reparations are needed for the communities, for the territories and the ecosystems themselves. But most importantly, we need to let it, let, pretty much let it go. We need to let the, terri the territory recover on its own. And this within a time frame of generations. This is not something that's going to happen uh, from here to 10 years from now, but probably hundreds and hundreds of years under the stewardship of the local communities that, that know uh, its rhythms uh, of life. Uh, in a similar way, addressing health conditions in infants must be a top priority, and specifically medical professionals in these regions must be completely unbiased and must not be uh, coerced uh, by the different mining companies, which is something that has been uh, referred to us uh, often in the conversation. I'm already at 12 minutes, I'll just do another example and then I'll, we can maybe talk about it at the end more. Yes, keep your time. Um, great, I'll, I'll maybe get onto this example. Uh, another image uh, regarding uh, energy democratization that we uh, heard sometimes in the interviews in the case of the Afro women in Cesar is the burden of the, the very unstable and bad conditions of the electric service um, in, their, in their homes, which leads to daily or sometimes more than daily power outs, which heavily damage electric appliances, meaning that they then have to pay extra to repair their appliances, and these are already vulnerable uh, communities. And that prohibitive costs have led uh, most inhabitants to then avoid payment entirely, to even band together to keep the community from losing uh, access to energy, which is which also causes that causes then like a, a, um, a loop on, on how the system then operates and uh, yeah, translates back into higher costs. 
Thus, again, a key element of a just energy transition must be ensuring equitable access uh, to electricity to all communities and populations. But this does not mean creating new needs. That was perhaps one of the more shocking uh, findings at the beginning of the research is that uh, these communities don't necessarily want more electric appliances. It's not about just distributing refrigerators to TVs or AC devices, uh, but providing enough for a dignified existence, for a dignified uh, life. One of the women actually said to us, uh, to answering to the question, what would you use uh, more electricity on? And she just said, I want to be able to blend a smoothie for my husband every day in the afternoon. And that's, that's it. So that's, that, that brings with it that, that notion of, um, yeah, of, of energy efficiency in many ways. Uh, another example is uh, the heart, also in this same uh, community of Afro women in Cesar. These communities have long fought uh, against uh, private landowners and land grabbers, uh, and they do so through a process that they refer to as picas. This is a moment where the entire community gets together. Uh, they uh, wield drums, uh, they share food, laughter, and then they go and together destroy the fences of the different uh, landowners in their immediate territories. Uh, and for them, it's, it's, it's a festive process. It's not a, a process of violence, but a, festive, but a, but a process of, of life, of music, of, of, of joy. Uh, and the rhythm, the, the drum, is a central part of this, of this process. And that's something that then relates back to how they understand uh, their struggle. Uh, leading back uh, to, to uh, social movements and to communities, this, for example, was first crucial in saying uh, that action and community action needs to start from there. And we need to acknowledge that uh, as social movement actors, that it's not all being here and, and, and talking and, and all of that, which is important, but also acknowledging the power of song, acknowledging laughter, acknowledging food uh, as a space for community building, also crucial in these spaces, also crucial as a way of creating networks, creating community that can then strengthen our struggle over time. Also helping keep keeping communities safe, which is crucial in this uh, difficult context, um, and so on. Okay, I did have some other examples. I think I'm going to leave it at that. Um, happy to share more uh, insights later on. You have the books over there. Just uh, as a final um, remark, most of the recommendations that we arrive at in the book, they're not new. They're not specifically new. Many of them have been uh, quoted numerously in different publications. But I think the key aspect to take from here is the perspective from which we are boarding these different scenarios. Like how are we centering the voice of women, the voice uh, of local communities, and how these can uh, in turn open up new avenues uh, for action. Finally, women are without doubt the main victims of coal, women in, the, in these territories, through care work, through all these different things, patriarchal dynamics, in, both in their communities and those uh, imported from Western institutions. But, and they need to be the, the, the key recipients of reparations and the key recipients of, of restorative justice, but at the same time, they're also so much more than that. They are agents of change, they're agents of transformation, social cohesion in their communities and societies, and they are the guardians of ancestral knowledge that will be key in restoring these ecosystems in due time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Oscar. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alisa. And thank you, Oscar, for uh, introducing this new methodology of body mapping. Um, I'm going to talk also about the Colombian case, uh, a different perspective about the ecofeminists, like the roots uh, to fossil fuel resistance. Um, yeah, I have been working about coal mining uh, conflicts, uh, con coal mining um, environmental conflicts impacts in the Caribbean region since 2012. So this is like a, 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 a collection of, of uh, what I have seen in the territory with the women. Um, first, uh, continue the methodology of uh, body mapping. Uh, in Colombia, the coal mine is an open pit coal mine. It's a, like a big ho uh, hole. So for me, this big hole is like a, the, the division of your body into parts. Imagine a huge hole in your stomach, 
like a, the open pit mine. So I wanted to, to show you that. And, and also here a, a little contest about the, the Colombia coal. Um, importing countries, a Colombian coal export. Also, uh, Oscar uh, tells you some data about it. Uh, what I want to tell you is that Colombia is the fifth largest coal exporter in the world. And uh, here is the, the, the largest coal importing countries. Uh, the first one is Turkey. And uh, the second one is um, Brazil, Chile, and Israel as well. And we have a peak of a coal uh, exportation in 2017. And we suppose since this year, we were expecting that the, the decrease of coal extraction. But now with the energy crisis, there is a, another context that we don't know what is going to happen. And also there are a lot of pressure open a new uh, coal mines and yeah, to expand the, the coal mine. Mm. So about the ecofeminists. So uh, ecofeminists point out the, the historical, material, and ideological contention between the subjugation of women and the domination of environmental. So as you, you saw, the, the extraction of coal like uh, is, is based of uh, patriarchy uh, notions. And the fossil fuel extraction is based on uh, those patriarchy notions since nature is seen as something to conquer. Uh, also, fossil fuel extraction is, is fueled uh, by patriarchal categories such as power, progress, and development, which is a very tricky, I, I, I want to say very tricky notions about development because the government said that they, uh, they want to extract coal in order the development of the countries, but the women said always development for who? Because we don't see the development in our territories. So this, uh, this uh, notion or these concepts are very uh, patriarchal co uh, concepts. And in Latin America, the ecofeminists, uh, the, there is a, a fundamental uh, notion of care, care about myself, about my family, my community, about my land. And in this notion of care, uh, they also talk about that we depend on nature, the way that we think about our, our environment, our forest, our jungle, our mountain, is that we depend on that. So this is uh, eco-dependency. And also uh, the women uh, th uh, talk about the cooperation, the solidarity, the community work, uh, also as a, the Zapatista movement. Uh, put the life in the center of all the discussions. So what I uh, did is try to analyze how um, the ecofeminists and the empowerment of women um, is, um, yeah, uh, how the ecofeminists and the uh, empowered of women uh, is uh, like a, mo a transformative uh, motivation uh, to resist the call, but also to create new initiatives to transform the lands. So that we see uh, about the ecofeminists is the, the women, there are plenty of women that, uh, for example, groups uh, that are, are based uh, of women, uh, for example, Mujeres Guayú, who uh, resist the, the coal mining in, uh, in Guajira, and also Mujeres Guerreras de la, de la Sierrita Cesar, which also resists the coal mining in, in, in Cesar. Uh, so they resist uh, it, with their bodies, but as well through legal process, and they start legal process against the coal mining uh, companies because the, that coal mining companies is violating the, 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 uh, the human rights in terms of the disposition of the lands, in terms of the, the expansion of these coal mines. Also, um, is uh, they try to desviate a river that is very important for them. And, and also we see here, I want to put here the, the um, there is a, a, a part in, in, uh, in that um, coal region, 
uh, a company, a, a multinational company, which is Glencore, said, okay, we don't want to continue to extract coal here. We, we want to move there. So they, they, um, uh, uh, they uh, produce a lot of um, unemployment in that region. Uh, so the, also the, the minor workers now are, are uh, um, like uh, asking that just transition in, in that region because the situation of poverty, the situation of inequalities, and also the situation of uh, so, uh, a lot of environmental impacts. And, and also what I see about the, there are two ways that uh, uh, we see the eco-feminists. The, here is the, the resistance, but also we see that the, there is a, a innovative uh, initiatives uh, created by the women. Uh, we collect uh, different initiatives in the, in the whole country, and we see that the, the um, um, common motivation uh, in the, all the initiatives was the ecofeminists and the empowerment of women. In all the initiatives, the, there are always a, a, a women in charge or a group of women in charge of all the initiatives. That's why I'm mapping from the he head of uh, the women, try to, to, uh, to innovate, uh, uh, to do um, uh, uh, initiatives to transform and to, to look for a just transition in terms of food sovereignty and community autonomy. Uh, also, there, here is a, a group of uh, Afro-Colombians on the south of the country that uh, this group of women work together in order to uh, find a way uh, to create new uh, network for services, like a, they call it in Spanish, Cambeo, which is the, the exchange services, things, uh, work. So it's a, it's a way that they are um, um, they are uh, try to to uh, uh, rescue their no the traditional knowledge, and also uh, they they do this uh, chain of uh, medicinal plants and uh, gardening, and and also here the um, the intercultural education based on indigenous com uh, cosmogony. Uh, in my university, there is a, a student that she created a. a uh, like a, a school in the in the mountains, and she tried to to uh, exchange the the knowledge between the the, the young people and the new university, but also with the indigenous uh, indigenous in the in the mountains. So uh, as you see here, are the women that at the same are, re are resistant at the same time, but also they are creating new ways for for just transition. Uh, so the conclusion, uh, we identify great difficulties in flourishing uh, community initiatives in territories where there is large scale extraction of fossil fuels. For example, Fuerza Mujeres Guayú focus their resistance on denouncing the impacts of coal mining, the risk of expansion, and also the, the forced displacement and human rights violation. But they spend all the energy to do that. I, they don't have the, the time to create new uh, innovative ways for a just transition. So they, they like uh, when you talk with them, you see the, the frustration of, of the people and also the, the a lot of struggles in their files. But you don't see uh, the uh, new initiatives in the territory. Um, so it's difficult for uh, for to have a new initiatives in a uh, in territory. Where, where the the water and the soil is contaminated, so that's why they they struggle or they try to fight against this this coal mining. Um, and also, we we see an, an, an alone of the country in territories without large scale mining. We we see women association that have established and consolidated initiatives of a, a, like a agroecology. Uh, a lot of initiatives with uh, uh, community uh, work. Uh, so there is a huge difference between the, the territories that has a large scale mining and territories that doesn't have a scale mining. And as a, as a recommendation, we need that the local policy must include changes in uh, patriarchal stereotypes 
cultures and, and, uh, and consumes uh, in the extraction of fossil fuels. We need that uh, definitely uh, as a local uh, policy, we need the representation and also the, the uh, participation of women in the making process. They always say uh, that um, they only, they don't need only to participate, but what they need is actually the people who are in the government represent the, the, their needs and the needs of the territory. So thank you. Uh, here is my students. So this is uh, also a work with my students. I have a, a energy transition student research group and the graduate energy transition. So what we uh, do in, in Colombia is to uh, to research and I try to empower my students to research uh, uh, and also to work uh, with the communities in just transition initiatives. Thanks. Thank you, Andrea. I am going to talk a little bit about um, the, the U.S. context, the United States, and I am a trained, uh, I've been working on climate energy issues myself for 20, 25 years. And I wrote this book called Diversifying Power, Why We Need Anti-Racist Feminist Leadership on Climate and Energy in 2020, in response to what I see, see as like a problematic framing of how we have been dealing with climate and energy policy um, with a very narrow frame that's very technocratic and um, insufficient and not working, right? We're going in the wrong direction in a lot of ways. So um, this book has uh, stories of very a diverse group of inspiring women and other leaders who are um, doing really innovative, creative activities and initiatives um, that connect climate and energy policy with education, with economic justice, with housing, transportation, with food and health. Um, so I uh, bring this perspective and um, um, I want to begin by just saying that climate change is not the problem, but a symptom of um, an economic system that concentrates wealth and power through extractive and exploitive economy. And um, this just shows in the United States, the widening wealth and income gap. And we know that during the pandemic, um, the billionaires have doubled their wealth. Um, so we, um, I think when I uh, think about this um, image, and, and the um, body mapping territory. Um, I think one of the things that comes up is particularly kind of the, there's a phrase that a lot of um, uh, women of color in the United States have been saying that I am, we are sick and tired of being sick and tired by this exploitative extractive economy. Um, so I think it's, it's really important for um, us to acknowledge that this system is being, you know, pr promoted through strategic investments for decades by um, what some Dario Kenner calls the polluter elite, who have been, you know, a misinformation campaign to deny the climate science, undermining public trust in government, and minimizing worker protections and worker rights to disempower all of us. Um, so. Um, a lot of my work focuses on um, kind of moving, be trying to encourage us all to embrace and move beyond this climate isolationism with this narrow technocratic lens based on very masculine colonial ideas about control and domination and this technological optimism that we can rely on these technologies that um, alone without investing in social change, social justice, social innovation. So I, th I think we're really missing so many opportunities for investing in people and communities. So um, an alternative view, and this is where um, I, I call it, you know, call an open invitation for all of us to think about embracing anti-racist feminist principles, which is really just about acknowledging the power dynamics of who's being 
profiting, who's being excluded, who's being um, disadvantaged um, with different initiatives that we have. And we have an opportunity to really focus on social and economic justice at the core and um, of what we how we invest in uh, broad investments in what people and communities need, base those on human dignity and basic needs, what some have referred to a people's first approach that is really about as we transition away from fossil fuels toward a more renewable based future, um, we can literally and figuratively be redistributing power. Um, and that gets to the energy democracy ideas. And we can use the climate urgency of climate change to leverage this larger transformation. So I think we're at a point where we all need to be embracing a transformative lens um, and that that in involves in connecting these, um, getting beyond this isolated perspective and connect um, and understanding um, how all of these, all the problems are interconnected and restrict resisting the extractive power dynamics. Um, chapter one of my book is called Growing the Squad, and the squad are these, um, the image here on the, your right, of these four junior congresswomen who came on the national stage in the United States uh, just in the past few years, and they really changed the whole discourse on climate and energy because they connected it with racial justice and social justice and housing and transportation and food and economic justice, and they based their work on collaboration and inclusivity and participation, really distributing wealth and power rather than concentrating it, which is the opposite, um, and, and focusing on reducing inequities and disparities by centering racial justice, economic justice, and energy justice, and leveraging transformation by linking the problems together rather than keeping them all separate. And obviously the antithesis of this kind of um, anti-racist feminist leadership is the traditional colonial white supremacist patriarchal leadership that we see around the world um, that we need to continue to be um, resisting. And obviously that kind of leadership is really based very explicitly on excluding certain people, uh, co continuing to concentrate wealth and power among those who already have it and denying that we have all the systemic problems that we have. So um, a few years ago, actually, this is a paper that is very connected, and I'm so glad I got a chance to mention it in this panel. I, we um, wrote and then kind of introduced this idea of embodied energy injustices, and this relates to many of us have thought about energy injustice um, um, in different ways, but what we wrote about in this uh, paper and this concept is that the the coal mining in Colombia and the and the injustices that happen in Colombia, those that coal, some of it is shipped to Massachusetts where I live, and we were having conversations and and activism in Massachusetts about resisting the coal mining, um, I mean the coal of. Uh, power plant, but we aren't always connecting it with the injustices of the coal exploration and, and mining. Um, and so with this paper, we um, bring together and, and encourage us all to think about energy justice and all the injustices all the way along the fossil fuel extraction and supply um, um, chain. So another um, piece that I think is really important. We've everyone's heard a lot about climate denial. Um, and that is kind of kind of blatant saying, you know, there's no such thing as climate change. Um, but one of the things that meant some of us are now thinking a lot about is climate obstruction. And we've talked about it quite a bit in this conference that um, now it's more delay right um and a subtle deception and distraction with all, and kind of a lot of this co-opting of the language language for um and this continued technological optimism right that continues to um uh, be so strong and i think one of the things um that the, the this delay really relies on is not listening to um, 
um, those who have who are not part of the traditional mainstream policy conversations, including women and women of color, in particular indigenous folks. And I think that um, on the body mapping, I think you can really think about it as um, the mouth or the you know not not being listened to, not being not integrating voices um, um, in into the that. So another piece of this that um, comes up is the racial injustices of fossil fuel extraction and fossil fuel mining, particularly in the United States. Uh, many uh, fossil fuel extraction um, and fossil fuel refining has been um, is, is, is cited in, in um, communities of color and the um, kind of very strategic um, approach to try to appease those communities and um, get get some kind of implicit or, um, approval and and then but those communities then have disproportionate health negative health impacts and all kinds of other negative um, impacts so um, I also just want to acknowledge that we, um, those of us who are um, scholars in this field, um, our own scholar activism is a form of feminist resistance, and I think we all have a uh, collective power uh, for transformation. We're at such a point in the this journey, I guess, that um, you know, we really need to be advocating for big transformative systems change, resisting fossil fuel interests, engaging with and contributing to social and economic innovations beyond the technical, um, and supporting cooperatives and novel economic structures in, in our own lives and in uh, different ways. And a shout out to the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty, uh, which we'll hear more about this afternoon. Um, and I just also want to acknowledge um, a lot of my colleagues and collaborators and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. And we have one more intervention. Um, I'd like to invite Nemonte Nenkimo, who we heard from this morning in the plenary, who'd like to share some additional reflections on inspired in this, in this session. Thank you, Nemonte. Gracias, Nemonte. Adelante. Bueno, primeramente quiero dar un contexto. Eh, nuestra cultura eh, era muy respetada. Hombre y mujer eran lo mismo. No había el hombre decide, la mujer decide, porque en este contexto, mi cultura antes de contacto vivían, la mujer y el hombre decidían juntos. La decisión y paz era la mujer. Uh, conversation a little bit of context from my own people and our traditional culture before we were contacted by outside um, society and before our culture went through a massive change uh, men and women were were equal in Waurani society um, we did one wasn't more powerful than the other we held power in balance um, and in times of peace and in matters of peace women were the decision makers y los hombres tenían mucho miedo miedo de mujer porque si no escuchaba a la hombre, la mujer no le dejaba la comida y no le daba hijo, decían eso. Porque la mujer es más fuerte que el hombre, en otro sentido. And so men had a lot of uh, fear and respect for, for women, um, because they knew that if they didn't listen to women, the women would not give them food and would not give them children. Hay que cuidar, decían, hay que respetarla a ella, y respetaban en esa forma. So men said, you have to respect women, and that is what they did, they did respect women. Y después de contacto, otra cultura, la evangelización del mundo occidental, ya se ha cambiado en los últimos años. Um, but following contact by evangelical missionaries, and the cultural changes my people went through, and that this has changed. Ahora los jóvenes miran que el mundo occidental trabaja hombre más, dice. Mujer tiene que estar en la casa atendiendo a los hijos y nada más. Now young people, they look to Western culture and they see how uh, men have to go out and work, whereas women must stay at home taking care of the children. Especialmente en las comunidades guaurani, así ha venido manejando el petroleras, los 
que trabaja en el ministerio ha dicho, hay que reunir solo los hombres, no hay que permitir a las mujeres. And, uh, and this has been um, perpetuated or increased by the oil companies. When they've come into territories, they have just met with the men. Y yo desde niña miraba eso que venían los ministerios de Quito y no dejaban participar a las mujeres. Solo los hombres reunían así. And as a, ever since I was a young girl, I've noticed this, how companies and government ministers would come into the territory and would only meet with the men. They wouldn't leave any room for the women. Y decían que ese es trabajo de hombre, no de mujer. And they said, this is work for men. This isn't um, for women. Y en ese, viendo, dimos las mujeres son, nosotros pueblos indígenas somos muy inteligentes. Y decimos que los hombres decidían eso era trabajo que no lleva mejor a la familia. Realmente vimos que la conexión con la mujer ya hubo la separación. No hubo la relación fuerte. And we saw how um, the separation between the relationship between men and women in our culture um, caused great harm. But we indigenous women were very intelligent um, and we're always looking at future generations and we understand the role we need to play. Y eso yo he venido en mi lucha también luchando bastante, eh, fortaleciendo a otras mujeres, escuchando a las mujeres más sabias, más adultas. And a big part of my struggle has been about uh, uplifting and strengthening women and listening to uh, my women elders. Y yo he visto mis propios ojos que los hombres son muy débil y no se pueden controlar con, ni con el dinero ni con el alcohol. And I have seen with my own eyes the weakness of men, how they are easily corrupted by money and alcohol. Pero mujeres somos muy fuertes y sabias. Lo queremos lo mejor para nosotros que alimentan lo somos mejor conectando, lo queremos lo mejor para nuestro hogar. But we women, we're wise and we're intelligent and we're always looking to the future. We want what is best for our people and for future generations. En todo sentido, no solamente en el hogar. En todo sentido, yo he dado cuenta que mis abuelas dicen la tierra es la madre que nos da todo el alimento y la tierra es muy respetuosa. Uh, and in every sense, I'm not just referring to within the household, but in every sense, we women, we see Mother Earth as, as a woman herself. Así somos las mujeres. Las mujeres damos la vida a nuestros hijos, alimentamos y lo queremos mejor, y el hombre tiene que respetar y tratar bien. No el hombre tiene que tratar mal para que le dé amor, cariño y la vida. Uh, Mother Earth to us is a woman. She gives us life. Uh, she gives us everything we need, and we women are the same. We produce life, um, and so men must respect us, and they must respect that position. Y mujeres indígenas tenemos esa conexión con la tierra. Cuando la tierra sufre, cuando la tierra está enferma, las mujeres indígenas sufrimos y sentimos enferma. We as indigenous women, we maintain that connection, that strong connection with Mother Earth. When the earth is sick and hurt, we feel that same pain. Y por eso es muy importante en el trabajo. Yo tengo mucho respeto. No estoy diciendo el, el hombre es mejor, la mujer es mejor. Para mí es mucho mejor es trabajar junto, equilibrio, dar la mano al hombre y a la mujer. El hombre no puede vivir sin mujer. La mujer no puede vivir sin hombre. And in, uh, in work uh, and in my work, um, what I'm trying to say is that I don't believe uh, men are better or women are better. I think that they're, they're equal. Um, men cannot live without women and women cannot live without men. Ese es principio de nuestro, nuestro valor y nuestra sabiduría que hemos aprendido muchos años. Hemos vivido como cultura indígena esa forma, sostenibilidad de hombre y mujer, no individual, no otra forma como eh, sentir eso. Tengo esa conexión. Yo muchas veces eh, con mi papá, yo he visto bastante y siempre veo que es compartir. No es que hay que dar poder ni al hombre ni a la mujer. Siempre respetando entre los dos ese equilibrio. And this is a core component of our belief and, and, and our lives as indigenous peoples is this, um, this equality between men and women. Um, and this is something that is, is really critical, is to return to this balance, um, to find balance both within our communities and with Mother Earth. Pero yo veo el sistema de la vida de aquí, de grandes ciudades, de esa otra forma. Hay muchos hombres que quieren más, 
a las mujeres muy poco. Eso yo veo que no estamos respetando. En principio, como mujer, le digo, ahora hay que hacer ese trabajo, hay que hacer armonía, hay que hacer fuerte este, este con laxo como una cadena, lo podemos hacer lo mejor. But I see how in industrial societies there's this imbalance of power that privileges men over women. Um, and if we continue down this way, it, our whole system, our whole life system will collapse. So we have to reclaim that balance. Más importante es el respeto. And that's based on respect. Ay, no más. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Muchísimas gracias, Nenkimo and Alex. Thank you both. Um, we have still a little bit of time. We have about 20 minutes um, for discussion and questions. Um, there's been some really rich presentations or comments. Or comments. Um, if anyone would like to share reflections, questions, comments. Um, oh, maybe. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Ines. Okay. And then uh, Zach. Thank you. Uh, Shin Yasuyama from National Institute of Women's Studies, Japan. So I come from one of the most patriarchal, misogynistic societies. So I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed of that. But at the same time, maybe I'm uh, also very insensitive to, to the gender equality, or maybe I'm uh, also captured by the fear, men of fear. Mm. And, but anyway, so I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering about, about, I wanted to ask about a question about coal mining and then fossil fuel extra, extra, extraction. Um, I'm wondering about, because even if we move away from fossil fuel to, to the renewable energies, we still have a lot of mining in a layer of material, layer, layer like you know, metals, which also quite have the same problem as mining. And so if the mining itself is a problem, it might be also like, you know, we will have the same problem even if, even if we could, like, move away from fossil fuel, like, in the mining. So, um, and perhaps that's the way I think, as Jenny said, it's important to, to see the diversifying the power, not the concentrating power. But um, I'm just wondering about what do you, how we could sense, make sense of this, like, you know, new challenge of the mining of, for the minerals, the producing to, for the, like, you know, solar PVs and batteries, which is important for, for uh, moving away from fossil fuel. Uh, that's my question, thanks. Thank you. Was that directed to one person in particular or anybody? Okay, let's take a couple questions and then we can invite some responses. I think Zach so I to... also, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, please. Go ahead. I know I'd like to go first. Go ahead, um, go ahead Zach. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, it was very inspiring and exciting. Um, I have a question for, for Jenny. Um, you wove a, a really compelling and interesting narrative between patriarchy um, and capitalism and climate change, um, and by extension, obviously, imperialism and colonialism and climate change. Um, and you also mentioned the stark inequality um, that we're experiencing, and that's increasing ever since COVID. Um, Amito Gosh calls climate change in highly unequal society is a problem from hell. Um, and I'd be quite curious to hear some of your thoughts on how we, or what changes when we try diversify power in more unequal societies compared to less unequal societies and the challenge or the increasing challenges that inequality uh, plays in um, anti-racist and uh, feminist mindsets within our policy and discussions. Thank you very much. Nontle had a question now. Any? Yeah. Ah, Nontle. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Nontle from South Africa. Uh, it's not just a question, uh, but I really appreciate all the presenters, uh, especially when they speak about the uh, feminism, ecofeminism. You know, when it comes to climate change, honestly, uh, the women are excluded. Uh, the decision makers, policies we've seen really experience that we completely excluded. 
and also when it comes to a uh, mining industry which is the most problematic uh, it's very patriarch uh, it's been pushed by men and i just see a good example in our community where shell also you know was trying to consult you know in south africa we are we have monarchies uh, they just prefer to consult monarchies. You know, monarchies are a male. And they said that we consulted communities. And it's clear that um, mining is more patriarchy. And uh, yeah, the other question is that you did uh, mention uh, in your presentation, I, I can't remember who, but the, 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 the food, food uh, sovereignty, is the most important thing for us as women. If the food is more, it's been affected, it means that the whole system is collapsed because um, the children, they need food. Us, as human beings, we need food for survival. But right now, as we talk about the global warming or climate crisis, what are you suggesting um, the, the resilience uh, 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 crops that you educating your schools, that uh, because I hear that you talk about schools, schools are very important tool that it, it can be used uh, for our communities to educate more in our communities. Because my worry is that we are talking about sovereignty, but at the same time, uh, the genetic modified seeds are in place, are uh, being promoted which is the, pro the, the other problem that we are facing uh, in our countries, because if we have more uh, genetic modified seeds, uh, we have more problem. Uh, in South Africa recently, we're experiencing a huge flood. Right now, uh, I agree with the presenter that uh, the women are more affected. Uh, since uh, I think six months now, but people are still sitting in, 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 in churches. Uh, women are struggling how are they going to feed children? How are they going to take the kids to school? But it's not even clear that our decision makers, uh, how are they going to solve the climate crisis as we are not even, as I was saying that renewable energy is still a hot potato. Nobody want to chew, nobody want to eat because we are more focusing on how can we make profit. But at the same time, uh, we suffer the most. And thank you so much, uh, Namata also for your presentation, a uh, very similar issues that you speak about, uh, especially the power, uh, you know, in, in my community where I come from, uh, I'm coming from the communal community where women decide, not the men decide. Um, mostly if your community is like that, uh, they always uh, been undermined that uh, it's not strong community, but uh, at the end of the day, the capital system always interfere and to make sure that they crush that system. Our monarchy, it was more women leadership, but what they've done in order to, to kill that system, they push the men to lead because men are very easily to be brought, to be sell the society. I agree. Uh, men are very, some men, not all men, sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, some men are very easily to be bribed. Uh, just a bottle of beer and you sell the whole future of your children. Uh, that is why I said that uh, if you put the women in your forefront, in your struggle, you are on the winning lead. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or we'll do a round of responses. Um, would you like to start, Oscar, and we'll work this way on the mineral sure. question? All right. The yeah. mineral extraction sure. frontier? I'm not sure if this, oh, it's on. Um, yeah, I'd like to comment on uh, the first question um, about uh, how renewable energies still uh, come in with, with uh, a very strong extract or can come with a very strong extractivist uh, paradigm be it uh, the mining of copper, lithium, everything necessary to produce uh, solar panels, uh, windmills, all of that, that, that's completely accurate. 
and not only the issue of of mining for the components but also the issue of how these uh, photovoltaic systems or the windmills uh, are set up uh, within the territories uh, in the north of colombia uh, there are already large scale plans to pretty much uh, implement uh, parks of or huge parks of of solar panels or huge parks of of windmills uh, which are in, in, in and as of themselves very problematic because they still ex exclude the local communities from using the territory. Uh, in most cases, they do uh, degrade the territory by just uh, uh, putting up a, a full uh, layer of beton on top of the, on top of the soil. Um, so that indeed is very problematic. Like everything around renewable energy is in and as of itself also a hot potato debate, uh, as you mentioned. But we are definitely beyond the question of, of if... Uh, renewable energies are, are better, but it's definitely a question of how. How should we implement uh, the energy transition uh, in a way that transcends uh, this colonial paradigm and this patriarchal uh, paradigm? In the case of our research, we, for example, focused on instead of just uh, paving and building uh, huge solar parks, how would it be if on top of uh, everyone's house they could install one or two solar panels that they could then feed uh, into the grid? Um, be it direct, either directly owned by the community or owned by a private agent who could maybe have some sort of agreement uh, with the company. So yeah, it's definitely a question of, of how do we do we do the energetic transition? Um, yeah, that can transcend those paradigms. Okay. Um, um, yeah, yeah. The the important thing about this panel about feminists and ecofeminists uh, is that in the in the transition uh, in the territory we don't think that the uh, the energy transition or the fossil fuels phase out is to move uh, to renewables energy what we need really is to to change the values of the society so the the problem is okay what what you said if we move to renewables energy we will still will have we will have still the same problems as as the as the mining coal mining is the because it's the same patterns as as uh, Jenny said is based of uh, capitalism is based of patriarchy and is based of of um, of extraction of the of the oil uh, from the from the land so here um, the thing, the, if you think about the ecofeminists and the values that the ecofeminists said of uh, the notion of care, of the notion of put the life in the center, of the notion of or, um, community work, is to think about other values for for uh, for the transition. How we think, how we are going to face out the fossil fuels, and how we are going to. Uh, to um, uh, supply the demands of energy, based in a base of another values of the this society. I, for uh, Arturo Escobar, which is a, a thinker, a Latin American uh, uh, academic, said that we are like a, in a, a civilization crisis. Uh, we need uh, to really change the, uh, the patterns of this of this um, society to make changes. So that's why I also talk about the transformative motivation based of, of uh, va uh, values uh, building by the women themselves. So I think, and I, I, I also uh, need to, uh, thanks to Elisa and to Mikel and the whole conference that opened this, this panel to talk about feminists uh, because as uh, my, what I learned about this panel uh, and what uh, uh, I forgot, I'm really bad. Uh, her name? Nemonto. Nemonto. Uh, she was say that w what we need is the harmony between the uh, women and men in the fossil fuel resistance, but as well the fossil fuel policy. So we are talking uh, here about the fossil fuel policy, fossil fuel uh, uh, or climate policy, and fossil fuel phase out. But what about, are, are we thinking how to change the system as well? How we are going to approach that? So this, this panel is like a window. We, we are planting some seeds for, for the, 
for uh, for changes. So it's, it's it's nice to 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 think about uh, 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 different values at uh, different perspectives of the climate policy and the fossil fuels. Yeah, Teresa. Yeah. So um, I wanted to come back to I guess first about renewables and mining and. Um, I agree what um, was already said about it depends how renewable renewables as a technology are not sufficient as an ans as a response right it's all about we but what is really important and this is where is sometimes lost in the technocratic discussions about um, moving from fossil fuels to a renewable based is that renewables every single community around the world has access to some renewable sources. Um, and so you could imagine a future with locally appropriate mix of renewables uh, based on what's accessible in that place, whether you're a coastal community, you can harness ocean and wind from the ocean offshore. If you're inland, there's geothermal, there's, um, wind and solar and and yes there's some extraction that is necessary but it's not a hundred percent just tr moving from this to this right if we if we had that local generation people would use the energy much more efficiently and so it, we're talking about a lower overall energy demand as well so so that's one one way to think about this um why it's so important because renewables the, the renewable source of energy the sun comes up every day the wind blows the water will flow like we know they're actually more reliable more predictable abundant plentiful you know free the source itself is free obviously you need to invest to get a, 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 a way to harness that but so i think that's what's really important to think about for for renewables um to the um kind of diversifying power perspective and thinking about in inequities and and um in policy i want to just mention like so many of our energy policies so far have uh advantage to those who already are privileged right the people who have electric vehicles or um solar on their roof you have to already have a single family home right and you have to have some extra money in the bank already so there's a lot of perpetuation of inequities and actually exacerbating um, with our energy and climate policies and the point is that um, I think it's not just in, in, in the United States context, at least, it's not just men and women um, and gender in that sense. It's also just acknowledging that when women, people of color, indigenous folks, others who have been disadvantaged or marginalized come to the table in decision making, they bring very different uh, experience that bring results in different priorities, different perceptions of risk, different um, uh, ideas and and that is what's really important and what we've been missing when we have homogenous leaders making decisions or 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 not diverse groups and and inclusive groups and so I just want to say that when I um, talk about feminist perspectives I'm not only talking about women um, and when I talk about anti-racist it's not only uh, people of color who are anti-racist. We need everybody, regardless of your gender, to embrace a feminist perspective. And we need everybody, regardless of your race, to embrace anti-racist perspective, right? And, and so it's an invitation for everybody to acknowledge the power dynamics and resist those, and then try to um, build in a better more inclusive, uh, and that's, I think it's necessary for the change, the scale of change we need um, for a, a, this more integrated uh, feminist perspective. Thank you. Monte, do you wanna, do you wanna share any reflections further? Or we can invite some more questions. I think we have a couple more minutes. No, no, we don't really, we literally have a couple minutes. Do you want to say anything? Si quieres decir algo más. Solo quiero dar un contexto como yo soy mujer indígena, 
siento que toda esta presentación de las compañeras, veo que el sistema está construido muy fuertemente de, de destruir la selva también a la vez en la posición de muy alto que deciden 100% son hombres y no hay el, eh, 50 por 50% de, de que Entren también blancos y también pueblos indígenas, las mujeres que pueden tomar las ideas y tomar las decisiones, porque yo siento que muchas conferencias a, hablan sobre protección de la selva, protección de los derechos de las mujeres. Es como yo veo, es todo canaliza, pero yo pienso que ese espacio necesita abrir en las toma de decisiones donde hacen políticas, especialmente con los presidentes, hablan en, en, en universidades y en otros, pero en toma de decisiones no dejan participar a las mujeres ni, ni los líderes indígenas realmente dejan solo posición, es representa el presidente y ante el grande capitalismo y eso veo es un es un riesgo hacia, hacia todo donde estamos viviendo ese sistema como humanos. Sería mucho mejor eh, abrir ese espacio así, mm. tomar, de, o, sea hombre, sea género, de todos, mm. participar y tomar decisiones colectivas para el bien. Y eso es como un cambio, daríamos un paso. Si no, la, el año va como una hora, como un reloj. Y esa es una preocupación, pero a la vez siento una esperanza que ya hay voces más de las mujeres y hay movimiento de las mujeres. Tengo esperanza más mm. años de ese espacio de construir mm. para el bien del futuro. Um, yeah, so as an indigenous woman, a lot of what my, um, my friends here on the panel have said really resonates with me, especially this concept of... Um, that there is a system in place that benefits and is run by men uh, that excludes uh, women's voices, indigenous voices, uh, voices of people of color in general, um, and that trying to change things within this very same system and model is not going to go very far. Um, she's, uh, Nemonte sees how a lot of times in decision-making spaces, be it political or even in conferences where we're talking about climate change and just transition, She doesn't see an equal balance of gender, of indigenous people to non-indigenous people. And um, how are we really going to implement changes when we are not including more voices at the table? Um, we're going to kind of be in the same situation and at the same time the clock is ticking. Um, and so if we want real solutions, we need to bring more a diversity of perspectives to the table. So that, that really resonates with her. At the same time, she has hope because she sees how little by little there's a growing awareness of the importance of thinking outside of the box when we think of solutions, thinking outside of the system, and um, uplifting uh, indigenous or female perspectives in these spaces because the women and indigenous peoples have been um, thinking in a certain way for thousands of years and have v just and valid solutions, and so we need to prioritize that more, and it's something that is slowly starting, there's starting to be a shift, and so that gives her hope. Thank you. Gracias. I think we're just almost out of time. I just want to offer some final uh, small reflections my, myself. I am really honored to have been able to be in this session and, and share with, this, um, ustedes, <laughs> with you all. Um, I think it's been, it's really, I, I really appreciate Oscar and Andrea how you brought this, you started us off with this territorial, body territory mapping and, and thinking, really grounding us in the lived uh, everyday experience of women. And I think it's a really a wonderful way for us to, something to carry on as we're thinking through the conference over the next day and a half or less. <laughs> um, you know, how as we're going into this range of presentations and, and bringing ourselves back to how is that experienced in everyday lives and particularly by women and what is the role they do and can play. Um, and I, I really appreciate how um, you all brought this to other spheres. I think thinking about this, not only how these experiences can be important and reflected in local policies, both through greater participation of women and indigenous people, uh, people of color, but also international or international spheres. And so how do we think about taking this, you know, 
feminist and um, lived experience into boardrooms and IPCC nego climate negotiations and national congressional discussions. And I think we have some, and also the, the importance of sh these transnational lessons. I love, Jenny, that you brought in the connection between the Colombian coal in La Guajira and the Massachusetts power plants and those lived experiences are, are connected by these literal per particles that <laughs> make their way from Colombia to Massachusetts. I, and um, so I think um, Nemonte's reflection also about how these spaces um, need to continue to be diversified as well. And this, I hope that we've made a little step in this direction today with being able to share experiences across different context. So thank you all for joining and look forward to the next session is in just 15 minutes. We have uh, two plenary back to back. So thank you all. Round of applause for our panelists.